Thank you for being in worship together. It's essential that we fellowship. It's essential to our own spiritual growth. This morning, we'll be talking about the true self, how God wants us to be, and how faith is a part of that true self. So let's go to God in prayer. God Almighty, you are the creator of our true self. You created that authentic person that you desire us to be. As we consider faith this morning, I pray that you just soften our hearts and help us hear what you would have us to hear in this moment. In the precious name of Christ, amen. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom,
We have been introducing you to some teachings by Dr. and Professor Dallas Willard. One of his books, In Christ's Presence, he talks about how his view of the Lord's Prayer changed over time, <clears throat> especially that phrase, thy kingdom come. He said he always thought of thy kingdom come as some kingdom over there, not accessible, something out there, not earthly. And he just always thought at the end of his life that God, uh, or at some point, he would say, life is terrible. God, just take me to the kingdom that you have for me. And at, but at some point, his thinking changed. And I'll tell you, for the rest of that story, I want you to hang tight. We will finish that in a bit. In our series, talking about our true self, our authentic self, the self that God designed us to be. And how as we go along in life, we find that through the power of the Holy Spirit, that love becomes easier, joy deeper, patience and peace comes more easily, and even goodness and kindness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control follow. In essence, over time, we begin to reflect the goodness and the glory of God. Or another way to put it is that spiritual growth is a process of becoming. Dr. Willard says that the most important thing God gets out of your and my life is the person you become. The most important thing God gets out of your and my life is the person you become. So we're all in this process of becoming our true self. And each of us, as we live daily on this journey to becoming our true self, we're working with the kingdom of God on earth. We're working with the kingdom. The kingdom works in our souls and begins to mold us into this true self, this self that mirrors the fruits of the spirit we've been talking about from Galatians chapter 5. And today we're going to talk about faith, but I want us to think first about the fruits um, of the Spirit. When I think fruits, my mind goes to John 15, 1 through 5. So let's look at the text. I am the vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in there bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing." So we have this beautiful, wonderful image of a vineyard with those fruitful branches, and we are the branches. Being uh, Abiding in the vine means we're deeply connected to Christ. And as we're deeply connected, the fruits of the Spirit begin to de develop within us. Being disconnected from the vine, it would be like taking my heart out of my body and expecting it to function. So as we tackle the fruit of the Spirit, faith, I want us to think about, uh, first of all, where my mind goes, which is to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 1 through 3. Now, faith is assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith, our ancestors re received approval. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from the things that are not visible. And then after this, if you continue reading, there's a long list of the ch church fathers and mothers, and it talks about their faith and also about their struggles. And it continues in 12 talking about them as a great cloud of witnesses. So when I read this Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, kind of it just resonates in my heart and I want to say, boy, that's true. 
But I want us to look a little deeper. And I want us to think about two things. What is this faith that Hebrews 11.1 1 talks about? And then some transformational tools that might help us develop faith in our lives. So let's look again at Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Now, first of all, we have to kind of get past this, what this things hoped for is. Uh, the things it's referring to is personal growth in faith, and it's holiness or sanctification. Um, I have to remind myself it's not about winning the lottery. Um, so if you really study this verse, the word assurance means a deep sense of certainty, this bold confidence, this unshakable confidence. And in one of my Bibles, my Wesley NIV Bible, it talks about this and it compares this assurance to having a title or a deed. If you own a car, you have a title to it. And if someone says, oh, that's my car, you pull out your title and prove it's not their car. If you have a home, you have a, a title or a deed, and you own the house, you own the land. Some of you even own the mineral rights beneath the land. So this assurance is something much deeper. And I hope you're following how powerful this is, that we have a deed to what we hope for. God expects us to become our true self either on this earth or I suppose later in heaven. And what this tells me in Hebrews 11.1 1, is that there, we can have perfect assurance that as we intentionally engage or abide in God, our end will be a rival at our true self with faith like Abraham and Sarah and Ruth and all this other great cloud of witnesses. As we, as John 15 said, as we abide in the vine, we become full of faith and overflowing. So faith is behaving like we own the house. <laughs> because through Christ's sacrifice, we have a deed to our own house of sanctification. In essence, it is ours, and it's what God wants us to have. So what does this journey of becoming our authentic self look like? Well, Hebrews uses the metaphor of a pilgrimage with a grand destination. So we're going to look at Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, referring back to Abraham and Sarah, etc., let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that so closely clings to us, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, abiding, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame and taking his seat at the right hand of God. So this pilgrimage that we have, we're instructed to run with perseverance, to lay aside sin, to abide in Christ. So like this great cloud of witness, we are called to move forward in one way or another. We're called to move forward knowing that it will be difficult. If you read uh, Hebrews 11, 4 and following, it will talk about all the difficulties that these people of faith, that these great saints had. Their life was not easy. So to summarize this first point, so the process of becoming our authentic selves, Jesus has purchased and guaranteed that as we live in him, abiding in his presence, having trust or faith in the process, that over time the fruits of the Spirit will begin to grow in our lives. But we have to remember this process is not passive. It requires our active work. There's no, I wish there were some osmosis, but it doesn't seem to work that way. And it kind of reminds me of baking bread. 
Um, you have to mix the correct ingredients in the correct amounts. If you want leavened bread, you've got to put some leavening agent. And then over time, your bread will rise and you can bake it and it will be beautiful and a fragrant, tasty um, treat. So that's what happens in our lives is that as we abide in Christ and uh, with time, these fruits of the spirits begin to grow in us. So second, I want to talk about some transformational tools. I call these transformational tools because they're things that help the process of you becoming authentic. The first tool I want to talk about is commitment or passion, and passion about abiding deeply in Christ. In Jesus' time, it's been said that there was a phrase, in the dust of the rabbi. And this implied that um, you followed a rabbi so close, you, you walked with him, you slept in the same place, you ate with him, and you followed him so closely that the very dust of the ground would become part of your garment. It would be on your face and your arms and your legs and possibly even in your nose and mouth. Can you see that in your mind? Well, in 2013, there was a wonderful study called In the Dust of the Rabbi, and this, this video is available to you on Right Now Media. And so just a little back story before we see the video. Ray Vanderlein, the teacher, has been talking about the schooling of children in Jesus' time. And apparently there were three levels of schooling. First, there was something like kindergarten. Um, and after that, there was a second level to about age 12. And most of those students went home at that point to be apprentice in their family business. But a few, a very, very few, the brightest and best, would go on to study under a rabbi. And so here is a short clip from that series. And then, for the few, the very few, who displayed unusual ability, it became a possibility to become what in Hebrew is called Talmud. Say Talmud. Talmud. Plural, Talmudim. Say Talmudim. Talmudim. Now, that's the word in Hebrew that we translate as disciple in English. So when you read the life of Jesus, you realize he had 500 at one point. He's got a smaller group of 70 that he sends out. And then he's got that really close-knit group we call the 12. It's really the 12 who are what the Hebrew word Talmud describes. How did you become a Talmud? Well, first of all, it's helpful to know the meaning of the word. When we take that English word disciple, there's often a sense, I find, in the Christian world that a disciple is someone who wants to know something, wants to know what the teacher knows, or in our case, what Jesus taught. But a Talmud is much, much deeper than that, because the Hebrew word Talmud means or refers to someone who wants to be what the rabbi is. Now think about that for a moment. Yeah, you want to know what the rabbi knows. You want to know what he teaches, but it's much deeper than that. I want to be in my walk with God like the rabbi. I may have a different personality. I may have a different taste in this or that, but when it comes to my walk with God, I want to be just like the rabbi. And that took both a deep commitment to learn the scripture the way the rabbi knew it, and many of them knew the Hebrew Bible by memory, or largely by memory, but it also took a passion, a deep level of commitment to say, no matter what the cost, I am willing to give up everything in order to be like the rabbi. A consuming passion. They live with them 24 hours a day. They watch everything they do, because how else will I know how to become like my rabbi? Now, before we talk a little bit about how you become a Talmud, let me ask a question that I ask myself. Are you a Talmud? Are you a disciple? Now, think about how a Christian might answer that question. Well, yeah, I believe in Jesus, so I'm a disciple. Or, yeah, I belong. No, no. Stop a moment. If you cannot say, if I cannot say, that we are consumed every minute of every day to be like the one we call the rabbi, that we wake up with it, that we go to sleep with it, that it drives us, that it pushes us into this text, that we spend serious time with him so we can become like the rabbi. If we cannot say that, we really cannot call ourselves disciples in the biblical sense. And in that sense, I wonder sometimes if in Christianity we really don't have discipleship 
in the classic biblical model. How consumed are you to want to be like Jesus more than anything else in the whole world? Do you have the fire? Do you have the passion? So how badly do we want to be like Jesus? So what I take away from the video is not that we're called to be rabbis, but what I hear for today and for us is that we're called to have passion and willingness. Now, looking back, we know that Jesus called ordinary people. It wasn't calling them to be rabbis. Ordinary people, like you and I. And he believed in them. He believed that they could do greater things than he did. He believed in Matthew and Andrew and Mary and Martha and all the others. And, you know, he believes in you. He believes in me. And because of that, we are called to reciprocate with passion for Christ. But I know sometimes it's hard to come up with passion. And so I have this question, how might we regain or renew, regain or renew our passion? And I have a couple of ideas. One, this um, In the Dust of the Rabbi series is something you have available, and you could study it with a group of family or friends. And I know we're all concerned about being safe, but you could study outside or by Zoom. And the exciting thing is our fall groups are coming up in September, and uh, Kathy Childers has some wonderful uh, studies for all of us. And guess what we have? We have a QR code. Get your, get your uh, phone out and put it on camera and scan this QR code. It will take you to a form where you can look at all the classes and you can even sign up. So part of your passion may be just a dogged commitment to sign up for something new. We offer all kinds of studies, including introduction to watercolors, and wouldn't that be fun? So another thought, some way to uh, do what Ray Vanderlyn says, bring fire into your soul, is to think back. You know, think back over the last three to five years. What did you used to do that nourished your soul? Kind of make a, I usually make a little list because I like lists, and then take that list to God in prayer. There's usually some, one or two things that you've quit doing, and, and why does it matter? But pick one or two and start doing them again. Maybe it's a daily devotion. Maybe it's something online. Pick one or two and see if you can gather some more passion, some excitement, some dedication to becoming your intentional self. So another transformation tool is to deepen your prayer life. So back to Dr. Willard's study sorry, his story. And so he talks about how he always thought thy kingdom come was, you know, over there. That either he'd get it in heaven or maybe it's not available on earth. But at some point that began to change. He began to think about it differently. Um, so in the beginning, he kind of thought, well, it's sort of like Star Trek. If life on earth is bad, there's a crisis, you know, you do what Captain Kirk did. You, the aliens are there. You're going to die. And you say, beam me up, Scotty. So that's kind of what he thought about the kingdom, is that God at some point is just going to beam him up. But for some reason, his uh, thinking changed. And he finally came to the conclusion that the kingdom is here. And we can pray the kingdom to come down here. So thy kingdom come. What if it meant, God, I sang this, God make the kingdom come down here, begin with my life. You could continue, God make the kingdom come down here to my marriage. God make the kingdom come down here to this hospital room. God make the kingdom come down here to my workplace. So praying, rethinking thy kingdom come. 
One of the things I do is I use my calendar and I set reminders. And my first reminder every single morning pops up and it says, count your blessings. Because I'm one of those people that take my blessings for granted. So use your calendar and make some uh, reminders. Just a couple of other little things that are transformational. Um, Find a mentor. Find a spiritual director, someone to kind of help walk with you. Talk to Christian friends. How do they grow in their faith? What have they found helpful? And so I just want to leave you with a couple of questions to consider. First, what does becoming your authentic self mean to you? And if you had to name one thing, just one thing you were certain God wanted in your life, what would it be? And then finally, what one step are you going to take this week to abide more deeply in Christ? It's in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Once again, thank you for being worship here today. And just a couple of things to remember. We invite you to be a part of our uh, outreach, making a difference in our community. August 28th, the outreach team, and hopefully you will be working in the community. To be a part of this mission, simply contact the church office at 405-324-1900. Part of our worship of God and our growth and discipleship includes our giving. So we invite you to give online or by mail, and the instructions are on your screen of how you might do that. And don't forget, in-person worship is still happening Sundays at 10 and 11 a.m. here in the sanctuary and in the Christian Life Center. Masks are recommended. We hope to see you in worship soon. Receive this blessing. May the love of God and the divine fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today and always. Amen.